is the sort of the science faculty's chance to show you what our departments can do and the kind of experiences that we can offer you. And I just really hope that you find the session today interesting and informative. Please make use of all the people from the Faculty of Science that are around here. They're here to help you, to talk to you, give you what information you require, and uh, hopefully tell you some of the things their departments are doing. Now, we've just got three very brief little talks uh, today, it's sort of been organised on the basis of seniority, I think. So what we have is we have a recent uh, PhD graduate, Dan Hikaroa here. Uh, we've got a, a slightly less recent PhD um, graduate, uh, Debbie Hayes, who's also going to talk to you, and a slightly less recent recent uh, graduate, Professor Margaret Brimble, who's also going to talk to you. So uh, without further ado, I'll just pass the mic over to Margaret, I think. I'll get the start. You get the start. <laughs> Age means you get to start first. So I'm the old person here, here to tell you why you should be doing postgrad. So I thought I'd just start with a bit of a personal perspective. I actually studied languages at school, did Latin, French, German, and maths, no chemistry. And I really only discovered chemistry at, at university, but I really didn't know what it was all about until my MSc year. So in our MSc year, we got to work in the laboratories and we got to make compounds. And in my particular area, which is medicinal chemistry, we got to make potential new medicines. So it was really at that stage, that MSc year or honours year, that I got to, just, to actually find out the creativity of the subject that I'd been studying and the, the theory of for many years. So I was putting the theory into practice. But it was the hardest year of my life. Even now, I look back, it was still the hardest year of my life, harder than the year that I had a baby and still tried to keep working. And um, I really, at the end of that year, felt like I was going to stop and just go take my BSc, thank, thank you, that's enough for university, and go and go teaching. But I didn't, I stayed on for the MSc year. Then I went and got a Commonwealth Scholarship, went to the UK to do a PhD, and then came back to New Zealand as an academic, and so I get to teach at university level as well as do research, and I'm very grateful for that opportunity. I get to run a, really, a good research group, working with some of New Zealand's most talented students. I also contribute to the New Zealand science community now, and that I'm chairing the Rutherford Foundation, and chairing the Marsden Fund Panel, the Physical Sciences Engineering Panel. And for those of you that are business-minded, I do actually have to get into the commercial world and then I do commercial work using my medicinal chemistry, uh, applying that, uh, using that, working with biotech companies. And we actually have a drug in phase three clinical trial with Nuren Pharmaceuticals that the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research invested $10 million in and it's in, in phase three, the trials are underway at the moment. So looking back now, why would I tell you to come and consider and do postgraduate study? Well, it's not actually all the great chemistry that I did. In my case, uh, the reason why I think you should do a, a PhD or an honest year or MSc is that it's at that stage that you actually get to, work, to focus on your project. So you, you're the, you become the driver, you take responsibility for the project, you learn to be independent, highly organised and demonstrate initiative. Well, some of you do, most of my students do. But more importantly, at this stage in your life, you, get to, you, you actually do get to focus on your project 100%. And that's something that I look back now and say, I wish I could just be doing my PhD project it's something that you'll miss, certainly when you're my age, because you get faced with very many distractions and interruptions and can't just get the job done. In my case, I did actually get to work on a project with enormous benefit to mankind, and that my students and I are lucky, and that we, get, we work on designing and developing new drugs to treat cancer, viral disease, neuro and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. So that's real, that real social good aspect of the work we do. When we're doing that work, however, you actually get to make lifelong friends. You may even marry a fellow postgrad, post I did, and I currently have three couples in my research group who met during their PhDs, and one couple are actually expecting their, baby, their first child in a few months. So, You also gain a lifetime mentor, not just a postgrad advisor. Several of my female PhD students have had children, and we still keep in touch, and we exchange photos, etc. And I even stayed with my PhD supervisor in the Cotswolds a few weeks ago in the UK, my PhD supervisor from, dare I say it, 25 years ago, and so that really has been a lifelong kind of mentor for me. You also establish valuable professional networks. Many of my friends from my PhD days I still keep in touch with. One is a fellow professor of organic chemistry in the UK, and we're organising a big international conference in Egypt um, in our field. I see him regularly when I go to the UK, and it certainly makes those long flights um, worthwhile when I get to catch up with him and a lot of my other friends. And one of my contemporaries is also on, uh, they sit on many boards. And this, one of my friends is on the board of AgriSearch, and he helped me get a very valuable research contract a few weeks ago. So that, that network, those networks actually do start from those postgrad days. What I also say to my students is, 
You can get a qualification and no one can take that away from you. Get your PhD, get the better pay, better paper, no one can take that off you. You can go and get a great job, really highly paid job, everybody's really impressed with the job you've got, but you could get made redundant and you lose that. But they can't take that degree off you. And finally, I think a really another reason why you should do a PhD, I certainly did my degree here at Auckland, had never left New Zealand, dare I say it, never been to the South Island, and stepped off the plane in, the, in England in the middle of winter to start my PhD. Nowadays, however, our PhD students, they travel enormously. They have to get in touch with the, with the international community in their field, and so they're often going overseas, you know, at least once a year, um, traveling to conferences and learning valuable communication skills, which is also another good reason for doing a PhD. So join up, whatever subject, Focus on a subject that you really that you really want to do. You'll, you'll know in your hearts what you want to do, and that's what you should pursue, not what someone thinks that you someone else tells you that you should be doing. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> Dan, would you like to carry on? Uh, kia ora tato. But maybe I'll. Can you all hear me down the back? Yeah. Not a fan of of, of these things. Um, as Alan said, my name's Dan Hukador and I, I finished a PhD at the University of Auckland four years ago now. Um, I won't say that I was sort of someone like you standing in an audience like this at the final part of my degree because I sort of had to make a decision that I had to do postgraduate because I'd mucked around for too much in my bachelor's. So I said, right, I'm going to go back and, and do my master's and work really hard and apply myself properly and, um, and, and get a good grade and, and get that piece of paper like Margaret mentioned that meant I could step up to the, to the job world and say here I am, I, I can do some stuff. Um, so I, I had planned to come back and do a Masters. I was somehow hoodwinked into doing a PhD but, but the hook was my master supervisor had a PhD project that involved work in Antarctica. So I was like well okay sure I'll, I'll do that work if no one else is going to do it. So. I got to do a, a research project in Antarctica with the British Antarctic Survey, but it was based here at the University of Auckland. And as, as Margaret said, it, it meant I had a lot of international travel with, with, with my postgraduate work here. And um, I, I came out of that with, with quite an amazing um, project. But what I did find was when I was at conferences and, and meeting with people and workshopping with people, that um, a, a key thing that, that really let me sort of punch above my weight, so to speak, was the really well-rounded um, education I'd received here at the undergraduate and then at the master's level. And, and perhaps the message I'd like to give to you all is that um, I know there's some big university names out there, the Cambridges, the Oxfords and stuff, but from my perspective it was the training I received here at the University of Auckland that meant I could go and visit people who had been at those institutions and I was faring at an equal footing with them or even better as a result of the um, the world-class expertise and training that, that I'd received here. So, so that, in, in very short, is, is a brief summary of why, why I did my postgraduate research, because I'd sort of enjoyed university, maybe a little bit more than I should have been studying at university. But what has that got to do with you guys? And I think maybe the relevance for you, and even though I didn't see it at the time, was that um, the reason I got to do that awesome project was that my supervisor was good buddies with the head of the British Antarctic Survey Geoscience and he needed someone to do the project. So it was the people here, it was their linkages, and it was their international recognition which allowed someone like me to step up and, and become part of, of, of this amazing world of research. Another great thing that I think why you should be considering doing postgraduate research, and, e and even here at the University of Auckland, is that it has always kept pace with, with the different changing, um, the changes and the waves that run through the research. I know this when I started my degree here, this building didn't, well, this um, annex down the back of us didn't exist, and the universities recognised the need. And I think when a university can recognise that there are new needs in different niches, then it's only good for its students, particularly the ones that want to come through and do a lot of postgraduate work. Since that time, and, and that PhD was in geology, and I was, I was mapping some of the rocks down there, um, but the broad base of, of, of my master's level um, training I did here has allowed me to, to branch out now and I'm actually doing work as, as varied as doing an industrial waste site rehabilitation on one hand and then with another group I'm doing some geothermal development. And I think that's another one of the, um, the strong cases that I would make for studying at the University, University of Auckland is that, like <coughs> Margaret said, you all know out there what, what, you, what really drives you and what you're passionate about 
And, and I was lucky enough to find out early on that I, I sort of was really driven by earth system science and, and earth science. And it was, it was the teams and it was the different skills that I was, that I was built, that I learnt, sorry, and, and the teams that I built and worked in at the University of Auckland that, that have put me in this position now where I can, I can command and I can do the type of work that I want to do um, and achieve the sort of projects that I want to achieve. And, and, and for my, personally, it means I get to sleep well at night. I'm not working on amazing drugs, but I'm, I'm working on creating economic turnarounds for, for um, low socioeconomic um, communities down in the Bay of Plenty. I'm working on an industrial waste site rehabilitation. So um, my advice to you all is, is to find your passion and then go and speak with these folk around here. I'm certain can give you great advice. And um, I would certainly recommend the University of Auckland has been a great place with a lot of diversity that is world class in its research capabilities. So thanks very much, Alan. I'm not sure. Can people hear me? Do I need the mic? No? Okay, good. Suits me. Um, so firstly, I hope you'll forgive me from reading from my notes here, but um, when I give a lecture or a scientific presentation, I don't seem to need them, but talking about my life, I seem to need them, right? Go figure. Anyway, when asked to talk to you today, at first I really didn't know what to say. How could I enlighten you about postgraduate study? This got me thinking. Firstly, I realised that I started my PhD almost a decade ago. This was a little alarming. But I also had the opportunity to remind myself why I did a PhD. From a young age, I always had an interest in science. I would collect tadpoles and keep them until they turned into frogs. I would keep caterpillars and hope they would change into butterflies. Snails were a particular favourite. Did you know that the common garden snail is a good swimmer? <laughs> So when it came to choosing subjects for higher level study, biology was certainly there. I had a harder time choosing an undergraduate degree, but pharmacology, essentially the study of how drugs affect the body and how the body affects drugs, sounded interesting. After two years of this pharmacology degree at Sheffield University in the UK, I was given the opportunity to apply for what was known as an industrial placement. Several of the top pharmaceutical companies offered a limited number of positions each year where students took a year out from their degree and worked essentially as an employee of that company. I was fortunate to be offered a position by what was at the time known as Glaxo Wellcome, now GSK. Incidentally, Glaxo started as a milk powder production company in New Zealand. I have to say that I was a little surprised to be offered the position because my second year grades were not what could be called first rate. Perhaps they had fewer applicants for the department I applied for. Who knows? What matters is I've never looked back. In that year, I worked on new drugs for asthma, screening them at their cellular targets called receptors. I had a wonderful time playing with all kinds of expensive fancy equipment and being paid well to do it. At the end of the year, I went back to my degree with renewed enthusiasm, consequently achieving much better grades. At the blink of an eye, my degree was over, and I needed to decide what to do next. Glaxo Wellcome had offered me a job in the department I'd previously worked, but I was also considering doing a PhD. The Glaxo job would have paid well and would have been interesting. It was very tempting. But in the end, I chose freedom. The freedom to pursue my own ideas. I chose to do a PhD. In the pharmaceutical industry, you are governed by many things beyond your control. I preferred the thought of academic freedom. So I looked around for a project. i had enjoyed working on receptors at Glaxo, so I sought a project in that area. One that appealed was on a type of receptor that had just been discovered. It meant there was a huge amount of scope for research in that area. I applied and was called to interview. I have to admit that the interview was a little intimidating. A panel of six firing questions at me. Slightly excessive for a PhD interview, I thought. But then, this was Imperial College London, one of the top universities in the world, so perhaps it isn't so surprising. I also had the chance to talk to my potential supervisor one-on-one, -on -one, his current students, other members of the lab, and to look around the lab. That is something that's definitely worth doing. You need to get a feel for whether you're going to get on with them, otherwise it could be a disaster. But I like my supervisor, and the lab and the panel obviously thought that I could do the PhD, so I was offered the position and I accepted. So I moved to London to embark on my postgraduate research. 
PhD completion time in Britain is pretty strict. I had three years worth of PhD stipend, so I worked hard to do my research and complete my thesis in that time frame. I think I handed in about a week after my three years was up. What really helped was that my supervisor was very supportive in encouraging me to write up my results as I went along in publications. I ended up with five papers for my PhD, which made the writing at the end much easier. It wasn't all plain sailing, though. My supervisor actually got a job in the pharmaceutical industry after only 18 months of me starting. I couldn't go with him, and there was no one in my department that worked on receptors, so I wasn't in an easy position. However, my supervisor and I worked through the options, and in the end, I decided to remain registered at Imperial College, but complete my research in the laboratory of our collaborator at another university. It was quite an upheaval, moving labs, but in the end, it worked out really well, and having no formal supervisor on hand every day gave me even more freedom. This isn't always such a good thing, though, because you need to keep on track so that you finish on time. But at that time, it was good for me. So, six and a half years later, after finishing my PhD, I run my own lab, have PhD students of my own, two of whom are just writing up their theses, and continue to pursue the research that I began almost a decade ago. I'm still as passionate about it now as I was then, and I am glad that I chose this path. It feels odd to be saying this, and it could be considered a little arrogant, but I'm sure that fellow researchers will understand that I am a world expert in my albeit focused field of research at 31 is a pretty special feeling. Postgraduate study has put me in this position. Thank you for listening. <laughs>